Hey, everybody. So it shouldn't come as a shock to you that I spend a lot of my day talking to companies about AI and people within those companies, uh, like different types of roles, etc. The number one thing that I have learned from these conversations is that you actually have zero idea what I'm talking about whatsoever when I'm actually talking about alternative architectures to AI. I mean that in the broadest sense possible. I mean that that is applicable to 99.99999% of people watching this video. Uh, and you are living proof of it every day through the conversations that I have. It's the bottom line within that. Uh, and then so to me, it all boils down to mathematics, right? I have had uh, business owners try to swindle me up and down. Other people try to like pay me money to extract like the hidden knowledge that I have when it comes to these things, right? What is the voodoo magic that I do to understand this in ways that you don't? I spent time understanding mathematics. Like I can't break that down to you enough. I'll charge you $20,000 to prove it to you. <laughs> like whatever you want to do in order to break that down, that's the actual equation. It all boils down to mathematics, plain and simple, right? What we're looking at is different types of mathematical equations to solve different problems. And the math works very simplistically and very funny and in ways that you wouldn't think of and in ways that impact physics and philosophy and et cetera. But the bottom line and the very first step is understanding mathematics. And nothing shortchanges that and nothing overcomes that. You either understand it or you don't. You can understand how to code up and down and not understand mathematics. I run into that all the time. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I run into that. But so within this, let's try to solve some of that knowledge, right? I'm going to go through essentially three different types of uh, AI within this particular video. I'm going to go over hyperdimensional computing, swarm algorithms, and large concept models. And I'm going to explain them to you in as simplistic terms as I can as to how and why they work and what exactly differentiates them from other forms of AI, <laughs> and especially the AI that you're used to, which is LLM models. So let's dive into this very specifically. And all of these are centered around XOR operations, which is very important, right? And XOR is a classical logic function within math, and it's XOR, right? So either or is literally all it stands for. And then so if we look at the XOR function in terms of Boolean logic, that's the easiest way to look at this you can see that it's a very straightforward, right? So if I have inputs that are the same, the output is gonna be zero, the XOR will be zero. If I have outputs that are different, the XOR will be one. So if my inputs are zero, zero, my output will be zero. If my inputs are zero, one, my output will be one. If they're one, zero, it will be one. If they're one, one, it will be zero. <laughs> and uh, all of that is just related to a simple XOR function, right? And then so within hyperdimensional computing, very specifically, what you do is you take this XOR function and then you spread it across, uh, let's say, a thousand dimensions, 10,000 dimensions. And so you, you're uh, taking a concept, whatever the, the concept is, if you're classifying images, um, classifying, it's usually classification or optimization tasks, right? But it doesn't have to be. But so if you're classifying or optimizing towards a specific problem, like a wave function, you just code the wave function as a by like a thousand dimensional uh, vector, right? So um, you would have in, in your hyper vectors, you would literally encode it. So you would have like one dimension would be zero, one, zero, one, one. And then the other one would be one, zero, one, one, zero. Uh, and then you just apply an XOR operation to that. And then so you would just combine A plus B, which would give you an XOR of 11101 in that instance, right? And then uh, the XOR math is just the XOR math. And it, like that's literally what your, what your output is. Um, and then so you're training the model at all times on this XOR math and on these binary functions, right? Like I can't stress that enough. Like uh, when I talk about how data sets are human constructs, how like the models are only taking and learning from snapshots of your data, it's very apparent when you're doing things like this, right? When you're seeing that, because um, I, I, I can literally provide you with the uh, amalgamation that the model is training on. So in this instance, the model is not training on A or B, it's training on the XOR of A and B, which is unique from A and unique from B 
it, it, the XOR of A and B is its own concept, right? It's a snapshot, an analogy. That's how I'm able to draw and understand very clearly this differentiation here. I'm just literally extending the math, right? It's not any sort of voodoo magic or, or uh, their craziness, right? It's, it's like literally like XOR operations. And then when you do an XOR, they go, oh, the model is training on an XOR operation instead of A or B. I mean, like that's uh, I can't explain that you know more simplistically, <laughs> um, and then so uh, from there, essentially, uh, why XOR is important within HDC? Like so, the like, HDC like XOR is literally how the encoding process works for HDC. That's all you're doing is you're encoding binary hypervectors, uh, and at all times, right? So the the uh, hypervectors are either in, in this format where they're zeros and ones, or they can be in this format where they're minus one and one. And then literally, when you're dealing with the libraries for hypervectors, you turn this on or off via like a, a, a binary dial, right? You, say, you set it to uh, either true or false. <laughs> and, and then uh, if you set it to true, um, then it's this. Uh, or, yeah, if you set it to, to true, it defaults to the minus one and plus one. And then if you set it to false, it's zero and z zeros and ones. It's flat out binary, right? Very straightforward and, and um, easy to understand as far as the mathematical concepts of it go. And then within HDC, like kind of like how it works overall is just very intuitively speaking. So, uh, the, there's two assumptions that are made within hyperdimensional spaces, right? That they are uh, sparse spaces and that these binary uh, functions are orthogonal. So meaning that the reason that the XOR function works mathematically is because of, uh, of orthogonality within this, right? So meaning that uh, if there is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1 uh, in the environment, then I can flip that and I, the, I would have the orthogonal of that, which would be 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And uh, that it would, that 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 would be orthogonal to 0, 1, 0, 1, 1 and the exact opposite. And then so I have I, two distance measurements by utilizing that. And it all comes down to distance measurements within these things, like uh, that's with all models, right? With LLM models, et cetera, they're measuring distance in weird ways. And you keep see, I, you, you're seeing that come up in more and more research papers. And I can't state that overall enough, right? Um, and then so just looking at a code implementation of hypervectors, again, it's very straightforward. So in this instance, I'm creating 10,000 dimensions for the hypervector. I'm encoding them into binary features, right? And again, so hypervectors are only dealing with binary. So it's taking uh, whatever this problem that I'm solving and then it's uh, turning it into binary hypervectors. It generates the hypervectors. This is all random. It's just random numbers that it generates. Uh, but I know that they'll be orthogonal once it's trained, right? Uh, and then I, I extract the unique class labels that it generates from here, which can be very different from the human generated labels. It's going to generate its own class labels. Uh, and then it's going to encode each sample and uh, add each to the prototype. And then it's going to go through and essentially learn off of this data, right? And then I create the XOR problem data in this instance. Here's my XOR problem. And in this particular instance, I'm going to give all three of these models the exact same problem. They're all going to be solving for this same problem. And that's exactly what I wanted to do, right? So they're solving for a mathematical optimization problem. And then in this particular instance, our HDC model gets 50% accuracy. And I can do that over and over again. And then so notice how this is running in literally zero seconds, right? Uh, it's running in zero seconds and then this response and nothing within this is changing. And then so that's like, one of the limitations within HDC and within these earlier methods is that they're very like um, they they can stagnate very easily, right? And then uh, it's like not impossible to draw them out of this stagnation. And we learn that more and more. Like what works for getting LM models to generalize more also works for getting these algorithms to not stagnate so much and not do this this same exact behavior, right? But so just highlighting that. Uh, you can change these. I'm just showing you the base behavior within this. And the base behavior is as expected. I'm getting a coin flip accuracy with this HDC approach. It's not the best approach for this, right? Like it's, it's uh, HDC, it's very simplistic. Again, what it's doing, I'm, I'm taking that problem. I'm creating 10,000 hyperdimensional hypervectors, which are randomly assigned either a zero or a one. Uh, and then it's 
solving this problem, that problem based off of this. <laughs> like it's not more complex than that, right? And it like people try to add more complexity. That's what it's doing. Like and that it calculates. And then in some instances it calculates well. Um in this particular instance it's not going to calculate well, but that's how it works, right? <laughs> and and in the instances where it calculates well, it calculates very well. And I can train the model to increase this accuracy. So there are definitive things that I can do to increase this accuracy very quickly uh, within this particular model. But just default ratings, right? So then the next is particle swarm optimization, which is a part of swarm algorithms. And I talk about this often on my channel a lot. So particle swarm optimization is a nature inspired optimization algorithm based on the swarming behavior of birds or fish. It's used to find optimal solutions in complex search spaces. It works literally based off of particles and swarms. Uh, and then you just code literally every single part of the mathematics that you can possibly think of within that. So you're coding like their positions, their velocity, uh, making sure that you're keeping track of their personal bets and their global bets. So PSO does incorporate internally a lot of memory functions are built into it, which is to me what I think makes it a good algorithm overall. It's the fact that it's distributed and it has built in memory is what makes uh, PSO like very strong algorithm up front, right? And it's also distributed as well. So uh, in this instance, like you're taking like, and so with hyper dimension, hyper vectors, and you're taking like 10,000 hyper dimensions, whereas in this instance, you're creating individual agents. And let's say like we create like a 50 agents or a hundred agents, um, and then they're all going through and then those agents would individually be doing kind of the same things that the hyper vectors are doing, right? But they have a lot more freedom. They're not just coding to zeros and ones. Uh, they're coding and they're operating based off of this, off of a fitness function. So they can, they are updating their position, then they're evaluating their fitness based off of their personal best and a global best. And then they're saying, uh, I moved left and uh, that actually put me in a worse spot than my global best, so I should move right. And that's kind of the logic that it uses is behind it, kind of that, right? And then so it's simple and easy to implement beyond the fact that it's hard to mathematically uh, code it out. Um, but other than that, it's very straightforward in concept and in, in practice, right? And then you can combine it with lots of different things. So you and you have lots of different versions of it. Um, and it's utilized all across the board in all different types of spaces. And then in this instance, we're going to do the same thing, right? Where we're going to take our same exact XOR problem, so the exact same data and the exact same problem, and then we're going to have this PSO swarm solve for that problem. Um, and then so they're each uh, each individual layer is trying to solve the problem. And then so they they are attacking each individual agent attacks the XOR problem individually. They create a fitness score that gets classified. Then it gets visualized. Uh, the model then predicts and then outputs essentially the best results of the agents, right? And you can see this code is a lot more because it's you're coding literally everything that you need to do for the agent behavior. Uh, and then with that more coding, what we get is generally better accuracy, right? So generally speaking, uh, like when I'm running this, I'm getting 75% accuracy as opposed to 50% accuracy. Uh, sometimes I'll run this and I'll get 100% accuracy. And then so this time again, I'm getting 75%. It's about 75% of the time that I'll get 75% accuracy when running this particular model. And then so uh, as you can see here, it gets better accuracy and we're, we get kind of more and better metrics that we're able to uh, output as a result of this, right? So we have our... Uh, uh, weights and biases that are being incorporated within this particular model that we can measure here and adjust so we can more easily adjust this model for better predictions and outputs than we're currently looking for um, within the model here overall. And then so the the last thing that I want to uh, cover for you overall is uh, LCM models or essentially like uh, large concept models. Um, and then so large concept models are the, the uh, model put out and generated by uh, Jan LeCun, um, essentially like a differentiation between um, a different format of uh, like neural network than large language models. Um, and, and they utilize concept spaces, right? And then so concept space stores concepts and their relationships, and then it creates knowledge graphs within the model itself. There's like a lot of concepts that a lot of people are, are big on are built into LCM models. So if you want to stick 
close and true to um, what LM models do. And if you like, uh, if you understand the mathematical limitations of LLM models and start getting into that, and you want a model that is literally built from the ground up to bypass those mathematical limitations while still doing all the same things, then LCM models are kind of your way to go. And you can see this is a lot of code, but this executed in three seconds here for all the code, right? And then so we're building uh, in this instance, a dictionary and logical relationships. So the model gets to, to build out and understand essentially its environment uh, is this XOR problem that we're solving, right? And then so it's an interesting to me how you build out this uh, this problem is what makes LCM models unique is that I'm building this XOR problem as an environmental problem for the model to solve, right? This becomes an environmental challenge for the model. So my XOR problem becomes kind of like a maze and then the model lives in the maze and its brain is in the maze and it solves the maze concept, right? And then so three very different and vast ways to solve this same problem and then like a lot more code involved here, but then what we can get is 100% perfect accuracy from this LCM model, right? Uh, and then so that's what we show and that, that's what we have here. Uh, and then we get also two like output graphs. LCM models can be, we can essentially see how it got to the input, what XOR operations it's utilizing uh, in this particular instance. So it's more traceable. Uh, and then we can see that it's creating very clear decision boundaries. It understands this problem very, <laughs> very dramatically and very overall as opposed to this, <laughs> Like this is uh, not not uh, anything near uh, this, <laughs> and then so uh, it this is classifying it exactly as it as it should be, and then so we're getting to the complexity of this, right? And then so it's just more and more complex problems or and and models to solve these particular problems, uh, but they're not generalizable overall, right? So that's kind of the big thing is like, so why wouldn't I just jump to this LCM model every single time? Because this LCM model every single time for every single project and every single task that I need it to solve for isn't necessarily the, the uh, most optimal way to do that, right? Maybe it's a probably, it's a baby problem and I just simply, I, I can utilize the X4 operations within HDC and I just need binary operations and I just need it to run for zero seconds and I just need very simple, like a simple uh, implementation of it to do it as opposed to writing a book uh, and then figuring out how to go through multiple mathematical concepts just to like prove out your simple algorithm, right? I can just go with the most simplistic solution. And then so understanding how these work together and in conjunction and why in what instances you would want to utilize one or the other is also very important within this, right? All three of these architectures and all of these architectures within AI, they stay as architectures because none of them is better than another one in every single situation across the board. There are situations where uh, hyperdimensional computing is going to outclass swarm algorithms, which is going to outclass LCM models, which, and then you could reverse that, right? It's like a pure, it's a rock, paper, scissors in pure reality in which you have millions and billions of different combinations. And then so in some combination, in some world, there's going to be an instance where rock beats paper and then where paper beats rock. <laughs> it's just how it goes um, overall. And then so it's better to understand all of these as opposed to saying, like, I'm just going to throw an LM model at every single problem. Like, that's like the worst thing that you could do. Uh, overall. But so uh, I'll leave a link to the description of this notebook here exploring different types of AI and how they work. And if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.